Kraft Foods Company, a division of National Dairy Products Corporation, presents the Kraft Mystery Theater. This is Ed Hurley, he's speaking. We'll bring you tonight's play in a moment. But first, our good craft cooks have a most intriguing salad for you. We've cut through these pineapple slices, and we're interlocking them, chain fashion, along one side of a platter covered with lettuce. Next, we'll add cantaloupe wedges and a mound of red ripe strawberries to fill out this corner. Then, for the wonderful dressing, start with a cup of velvety craft mayonnaise and gradually blend in a fourth of a cup of cranberry juice. So simple, but it seems so special. Of course, you don't have to add anything to Kraft mayonnaise, but it is the smoothest, easiest mixing mayonnaise you ever tried. Lots of eggs and extra egg yolks go into Kraft mayonnaise, but it's Kraft's particular blend of oils and special beating process that make it so velvety and easy to mix. This cranberry blend has a refreshing tang, and it's a delicate, appealing pink, delightful with fresh fruits. This summer, create new dressings of your own with the mayonnaise specially made for blending. Velvet texture, Kraft mayonnaise. This is Skycraft Yoke Dog. I'm flying at 5,000 feet in severe turbulence, positioned five miles north of Linton over Bristol Channel. Must come to 7,000. Request approval. Over. Skycraft Yoke Dog. This is London Air Traffic Control. Stand by a moment. You are clear to climb to 7,000. Report leaving five and reaching seven. Over. I am now leaving five at 2240. London Control, London Control, emergency fire in starboard engine. Skycraft plane, licensed GALYD, which crashed in the Bristol Channel this morning. Earlier, we announced that three passengers were known to be aboard the plane. It is now believed that only two passengers were aboard. I repeat, in correction of an earlier announcement, it is now believed that only two passengers were aboard the Skycraft plane that crashed in the Bristol Channel this morning. This new information was conveyed to the Ministry of Transport and Civil Aviation by Mr. Henry C. Douglas, a mechanic at the Brickford Airport. I've already talked to reporters and the Ministry people till I'm blue in the face. There ain't much more I can tell. Well, I'm Inspector Lewis of the Exeter Police. I want to check some facts with you. Now, you were on duty the morning of the takeoff, eh? That's right. And you saw two passengers boarding the plane? That's right, two men. Is there any chance that a third passenger might have boarded without your knowing? Well, not a chance. I was no more than 20 or 30 feet from the plane right up to the moment she took off. There was only two. Well, the airport records indicate that the plane was chartered by three people. 
How do you account for that? Well, I guess one of them changed his mind or took sick the last moment. Those things will happen, you know. Can you describe the men for me? Well, I think one was just a bit taller than the other. But he might have been standing on the boarding ladder. I can't be sure of that, sir. Uh, did you ever hear any parts of their conversation? Not that I can remember. Well, just one more question. In uh, your opinion, is there any chance, even the slightest chance, that uh, the plane might have been sabotaged? Impossible. There was nobody near that plane but me, right up to the moment she took off. I see. Well, um, thanks very much. You're welcome, Inspector. I'm sure. Hello, Charlie. <laughs> Why, come in, son. Come Thank in. You. By George, I am glad to see you. Why, it's just like old times. Nothing seems to have changed very much. Ah, uh, but it has, Jack. Everything's changed ever since the... Well, of course, you heard. Mm -hmm. How is Hester taking it? Not too well, I'm afraid, Jack. Not too well. She... She's hardly left her room since yesterday, and... Well, of course, you you know they were to be married in two weeks. Yes, I heard about that. It was against my wishes, Jack. I always thought that you were the man for Hester. Well, that made two of us, Charlie. Do you suppose there's uh, any chance of my seeing her? Why, yes, she's upstairs. Go on up, Jack. She'll be happy to snake you. No, not yet. We're still dragging the Bristol Channel for the bodies. I'm sorry, Hester. If only I knew one way or the other. This is the worst, not knowing. You loved Harry Walters very much, didn't you? Very much. I assume he felt the same way about you. But of course he did. Why do you ask? Hester, it's 48 hours since the crash. No one has come forward to say that they changed their mind about flying or that they missed the bus on the way to the airport. I should imagine that if... Harry Walters were alive, he'd have been in touch with you by now. Something else has happened to him. An auto collision. No, 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 it couldn't be. I've checked all the hospitals and mortuaries between here and Glasgow. But to be frank, uh, Hester, it begins to appear as though the man who didn't fly might have had a reason for wanting to disappear. Harry had no reason to disappear. Well, then there's only one other possibility. Yes? Well, just a chance that the man who didn't fly might have been the victim of some crime. Well, I only say it's a possibility. I can't be sure of anything, can I? Was Harry on the plane? Was he off? Is he dead or alive? Every time the telephone rings at the doorbell, now it begins to pound like a hammer. Oh, Hester, listen to me. I want to help you. Believe me, if it's humanly possible, I'll find out if Harry Walters was on that plane. But you've got to help me. You've got to tell me everything you know about those three men, their relationship to each other, and why they wanted to fly to Liverpool. That's not a simple question to answer. But I can tell you this. Everyone in this house hated Harry. Everyone but me. That was clear from the very first day that Harry arrived. It was in July. About a month after you and I stopped seeing each other. Harry descended upon this house with the wildness and flash of a summer storm. Thank you very much. 
seconds. I took you exactly 42 seconds, during which time I might have collapsed from pneumonia. I expect you'd be prepared to pay damages. Oh, but I'm not the landlord here. I'm only a guest. Morgan Price. Harold Walters. Well, will you fetch the owner of this uh, dismal establishment and tell him that a wealthy and illustrious client has arrived? Uh, yes, I'll see if he's about. Mr. Wade! Mr. Wade! You, the lovely innkeeper's daughter, it's worthy of a Canterbury tale. If you're interested in lodgings, I can tell you what's available. Please do, I'd like very much to know what's available. Well, uh, we have a small single room facing rare at five guineas, and a larger one with private bath at seven guineas. Meals are included. Good, I'm fond of meals. If you'd care to register? Uh, before I do, I'd like very much to know uh, what facilities you have to offer. Facilities? And as you know, riding, boating, swimming, facilities. Uh, you, your ad contained an attractive phrase. What was it? The perfect summer holiday. I assume you do have facilities? Oh, yes. We're, we're close to some beautiful country lanes, quite suitable for hiking. And you can take a bus to the River Tor. It's perfectly adequate for, for wading, if, if you don't mind the pebbles. And uh, we're only five miles from Exeter. There's a cinema there. Oh, good. It's air conditioned. How will I stand the excitement? If you're after excitement, I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place. Excuse me. Excuse me. I apologize. I'm sorry. I adore country lanes and pebbles and air-conditioned cinemas, depending on whom I'm with, of course. I'll take that seven-guinea arrangement. I'm Hester Wade. Dinner will be served at seven o'clock. I'm Harold Walters. Same initials. Harry was late getting down to dinner that evening. So, as usual, we had to listen to Joe Ferguson and his tiresome business advice. Oh, I'd stay away from foreign utilities right now. There, Charles, that's a bit of inside information for you. And to think I almost bought shares in Nigerian power. If I hadn't stopped you, Father. You know, it's absolutely beyond me, Joe. How do you learn these things? I make it my business to learn, Charles. Investment is a science, the most fascinating science in the world. The most boring, you mean? Oh? And where would you be without it, my dear? On the French Riviera with the Bartons. And so would you be if it weren't for that Liverpool thing. Oh, uh, what Liverpool thing is that? Some theatres I'm buying. It's nothing for you, Charles. Theatres, eh? Yes, the O'Malley cinema chain. Being closed for a number of years, we are going to rip out all the seats and convert them into parking garages. Oh, I think that's an excellent plan. I think it's a little sad. More shepherd's pie, Mrs. Ferguson. Oh, no, thank you, darling. It's really delicious, but I've had... Quite enough. Good evening. I'm sorry, Emily. Mr. Walters, I'd like you to meet our other guests. This is Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson. Yeah, how do you do? I didn't catch the name. Ferguson. Mr. Morgan Price. We've met. And this is my father, Charles Wade. Welcome to our house, sir, and to our table. Thank you. Won't you be seated? Mm -hmm. I hope you'll enjoy your stay here. Thank you very much. I found it excellent for convalescence. London. Isn't everyone? Not me. I'm from Hampshire. No, actually, my mother represented Wilts. She was a member of Parliament. Oh, yes. Maggie Price. I remember her well. Good woman. Conservative. Yes. In everything. I died recently of some mysterious stomach ailment, didn't she? I remember reading something about it. I'd rather not discuss it, if you don't mind. Are you on a holiday, Mr. Walters? You might call it that. Would you pass the shepherd's pipe in? If poets ever take holidays. Poet? Yes. I presume my daughter has told you of our terms here. Oh, you needn't worry, Mr. Wade. Uh, we're not all starving, you know. I've already paid in advance. Oh, I didn't mean to infer... Of that. course you didn't. There's no need to be embarrassed. It's a very widespread attitude. Are you one of those jingle writers for the ads, Mr. Walters? I'm one of those jingle writers, Mr. Ferguson, for the truth and love and beauty. Waste of time, if you want my opinion. Uh, do you agree that it's a waste of time, Mrs. Ferguson? I prefer reading novels. You ought to try something else for a change. Might be refreshing. I like free verse mostly. Whitman, Cummings, Amy Lowell. We seem to have the same tastes, Miss Wade. 
Perhaps you'd enjoy reading some of mine someday. I think I would like that, Mr. Walters. I'm rereading Byron now. They say he led a rather wild life. Quite tame by modern standards. There are people nowadays who make Byron look like a prude. No doubt they live in the artist's quarter, Bart. Yes. <laughs> On the contrary, most artists lead a celibate life compared to those of the business world. I assume you are of the business world. I don't think I like your implications, Mr. Walters. Nor I, sir. But they're not implications, gentlemen. They're facts, borne out by an exhaustive study of the subject. You see, most artists live and breathe in an atmosphere of love and therefore have no unusual craving for it. But the businessman, bored with his arithmetic idiocies, is inclined to seek more sensual diversions. That's quite enough, Mr. Walters. I agree with you, sir. It is. Indeed, quite enough. Excuse me. I think you've both been perfectly dreadful. Hester! I'm terribly sorry, Joe. You should be taking in that kind of riffraff. I wouldn't take that salt in for a hundred a week if it was Hester who let him have the room. Stop raining. Yes, it has. That's a handsome jacket, Mr. Walters. Some people think it's too bold. I don't. I'm sorry for what happened in the dining room. Oh, that's all right. I'm used to it. The artist versus the Philistines is quite an old battle. I liked what you said about living and breathing in an atmosphere of love. That must be wonderful. Surely you're no stranger to love. A pretty girl like you must have had many proposals. Oh, come on. Only one. He's with the extra police. A constable? No, an inspector and, and a very nice man. But? There was something lacking, something I couldn't define. Like the stars? Like the stars. Without you, I am the night without stars. An infinite blackness, unwarmed by the fires of your love. Unembraced, I embrace all the world, yet have nothing. For I am the absence of life without you. Is that one of your poems? The beginning of one, I've never thought it was quite complete. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. Hester? Yes? Your father would like to see you. Just a minute. I I'd like you to stay, Mr. Walters. I promise you'll be welcome. I don't think your father would agree. Oh, don't worry about father. He'll fret and fume and end up doing as I suggest. He always has. All right. Till tomorrow, then? Until tomorrow. Father did as I expected. He fretted, fumed, and made violent sounds about not wanting rude, undesirable people. But, in the end, he agreed that Harry could stay. And these three men you've described, Joe Ferguson, Morgan Price, and Harry Walters, they were the three who chartered the plane. Joe Ferguson actually chartered the plane. Later, the others arranged to go with him. Three men arranged for a flight. Only two were seen boarding the plane just prior to the crash. One man unaccounted for, very possibly a lie. Oh, God, make it be Harry, please, please, make it be Harry. You don't have to pray any longer, Hester. I can tell you that Harry didn't fly. How do you know? I know a great deal about Harry, perhaps more than you, though I admit it took me longer than a week. I don't believe you. Harry never intended to fly, Inspector. He never intended to come back to this house. It's a lie. Don't listen to it, Jack. They never had any use for Harry because he was a poet, an artist. He was an artist, all right, but not the kind you think. Harry Walters was a blackmail artist and a thief. We'll return in a moment with the second act of The Man Who Didn't Fly. Right now, though, we have something that really will interest you Weight Watchers. We'll return in a moment with the third act of tonight's play. But first, if anybody you know has to watch the scales, we have a seasoning trick that saves a lot of calories. Use new Kraft low-calorie dressing to flavor and season cooked cauliflower. 
Just pour it on the hot cauliflowerettes and toss them lightly to distribute the vivid spice and tomato flavor of the dressing. Kraft's doesn't taste like a diet dressing at all. You'd never guess it has a mere three and a half calories per teaspoon. Try this delicious seasoning trick with cooked beets or green beans or zucchini squash, too. And Kraft low-calorie dressing makes vegetable salads taste so good, you don't have to separate the dieters from the non-dieters. We're tucking slices of unpeeled cucumber into slices that we've made at regular intervals across peeled tomatoes. Now, isn't that striped effect good-looking? Full of vitamins, too, and full of flavor when you use Kraft low-calorie dressing. It has a smooth, exciting taste that just tingles with tomato and spices. Yes, it has everything, except a lot of extra calories. Grocery stores are featuring new Kraft low-calorie dressing now. Look for it in the regular salad dressing section or in the dietetic section. It's the bright red one in the bottle with the green and silver label that says Kraft low-calorie dressing. That's a cheap, nasty thing to say about a man who was good and decent. But you weren't very good and decent, were you, Hester? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't play the innocent maiden with me. I saw you throw yourself at him the very first night he arrived. And knowing Harry, I'm sure he offered no resistance. Why, you filthy oh, mother! Enough, Mrs. Ferguson. If you have any information to add, please state it. Yes, I have information, Inspector. I can tell you about the real Harry Walters and why I know he's the man who didn't fly. Go on. I hadn't seen Harry for nearly two months when he arrived here at the boarding house. First night he was here, sitting through that horrible dinner. It was torture for me. They're not implications, gentlemen. They're facts. Born out by an exhaustive study of the subject. You see, most artists live and breathe in an atmosphere of love and therefore have no unusual craving for it. But the businessman, Bored with his arithmetic idiocies, is inclined to seek more sensual diversions. That's quite enough, Mr. Walters. I agree with you, sir. It is. Indeed. Quite enough. Excuse me. I think you've both been perfectly dreadful. Hester! Joe, I'm terribly sorry. You should be taking in that kind of riffraff. I, I, I wouldn't take in that sort of riffraff for a hundred a week. It was Hester who gave him the room. If you were a businessman, Charles, you'd be running this place yourself, not delegating all your authority to a 22-year-old who reads poetry. Tell him to pack up and leave right now. Why don't you explain to her in a calm, rational way that, that old friends are more important to you than rude young strangers? She'll listen to reason. You really think she will? Oh, I'm sure of it, Charles. I'll fetch her for you. Excuse me. <laughs> Until tomorrow, Hester. How did you find me? Quite easily, as a matter of fact. Next time you decide to go into hiding, don't tell the doorman where to forward your mail. I see you haven't lost much time. Really, Maura? Jealousy hardly becomes you. Me? Jealous of you? Don't be ridiculous. I must say you disappoint me. How do you mean? I can well understand your reasons for wanting obscurity, but really, you might have chosen a more elegant place. My husband has known Charles Wade since he was a boy. I'll touch you. Tonight, we can all sing old Lang Syne. What do you want of me? Money? Let's not talk about these sordid things, Maura. Let's, let's talk about the beautiful moments we've shared together. The weekend motor trip. A small hotel at Brighton. I wonder if Joe's ever been to Brighton. Must you torture me like this? Torture? To recall those beautiful moments, really, that's not very complimentary to me. 
Harry, I'm not in the mood for your repartee. I made a mistake and I'm willing to pay for it. Just tell me how much and let's get it over with. Well, since you're so determined to force money on me, I could do very well with 500 pounds. Will I be rid of you then? Life is so uncertain, Mara. One can never be sure of these things. Unless, of course, you murdered me. But that's such a messy job, darling. Five hundred is a lot of money. A check will do. I don't have that much in my checking account. Perhaps Joe has been to Brighton. If you can hold on for a week, I'll get it for what you. What happens in a week? Joe's going to Liverpool. I can go up to London and take it out of savings. Will you wait? I'd be delighted to wait. Mr. Walters. Yes. Although I was silent during the argument, I want you to know that I'm on the side of the artist. Good for you. Welcome to Bohemia. Oh, I'm hardly a Bohemian. I'm much too financially secure for that. Are you really? Yes. Mother left me quite a nice trust fund. Your mother meant a great deal to you, didn't she, Morgan? Let us say that she had a great influence over my life. Whatever I wanted to do, Mother always managed to oppose. What did you want to do? Paint. Mother said it was not a respectable life. But since her death, I dabbled a bit. Though never professionally, of course. Why not? Well, I understand that to produce true art, one must live and suffer. But you see, my health is very fragile. Suffering needn't be as great as you imagine, Morgan. Perhaps, perhaps I can make art more pleasurable for you. <laughs> art was pleasurable for Harry. This time, 850 pounds worth of pleasure. That's a filthy lie. Everything she said's been a lie. Oh, Hester, do you think you're the only woman who ever listened to Harry's poetry in the moonlight? Maybe not. But he was no blackmailer. You're making that up to protect your husband. My husband is dead. Why should he need protection? Because he was a thief, a confidence man. Oh, you have no right to say that. If anyone had a reason to vanish, it was him. Unless he did something to Harry. He threatened to murder him once. Hester! You can't stop me from telling the truth! You don't even now, know... Now, just a minute. I want to hear about that. I was sure that Harry was wrong about Mr. Ferguson. He had to be wrong. And yet, that day, as I watched him at lunch, I began to wonder whether any man could be as intensely devoted to business as Mr. Ferguson seemed to be. Ah! Uh. Mediterranean oil up two points, Charles. My hunch was right. Joe, uh, about that O'Malley theater proposition. Yes, what about it? What sort of a return do you expect? Fifteen to twenty percent. I see. Joe, I've a little private capital. It's only 850 pounds, but I thought with careful investment, now, I don't might be able... your breath, Charles. I won't let you come near the O'Malley thing. But why not? It's too much of a gamble for a man of your means. You could lose your shirt. Fifteen or twenty percent, or possibly nothing. No, I can afford the risk, Charles. You can't. But I don't mind a little risk, Mr. Joe. If you come into the garden, I will shut it any further, Charles. If you want to invest, we'll wait until something... Uh, where are you going, Hester? Into the garden for a few minutes. Excuse us. If she were my daughter, I'd put a quick end to that. Yes. Perhaps I should put an end to it. How long has your father known Ferguson? For years, darling. Why? Because I've been to Liverpool once or twice. I've never heard of the O'Malley chain. Mr. Ferguson said the theatres have been closed for years, probably before your time. Hester, you're a beautiful girl, but you're also very naive. I've seen a few confidence men oh, at work darling. in my time, but... This time you're wrong, completely wrong. What? Father's been begging to get in on that theatre deal, but Mr. Ferguson won't touch a penny of his money. He says it's much too speculative. I bet you've never done much fishing. 
What's that got to do with it? You don't shove the bait down the fish's mouth. You dangle it tauntingly in front of his eyes until he snaps at it out of hunger. Oh, excuse me. Oh, uh, that's all right, Morgan. Why don't you play a spot of croquet with Harry while, while I'm fixing lunch? Don't forget what I told you. I'll see you later, darling. Choose your weapons, Morgan. Red or green? Um, no, thank you. I don't feel like playing just now. What's the matter? Bad news? No, no. Oh, it's just a letter from the Hampshire County officials. They're holding an inquest into Mother's death. Morgan, did you kill your mother? What? Oh, that's a horrible thing to say. Of course I didn't. I'll see you at lunch, old man. Mr. Walters. Did you really think I killed my mother? Yes, Morgan, I really did. I was sure that Harry was wrong about Mr. Ferguson. He had to be wrong. And yet, that day, as I watched him at lunch, I began to wonder whether any man could be as intensely devoted to business as Mr. Ferguson seemed to be. We won't sell a share, I told him. Let the others be swept away in the panic. While they're busy selling, we'll buy. That's excellent strategy. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And what do you think happened then? You made your first million. No, not quite. But I was well on my way. Merchandise, stocks, real estate holdings. I never let a penny stand idle. Oh, it's no wonder you've made a fortune, Joe. Anybody can do it, Charles. Activity, that's the secret. Activity and growth. Telegram, Mr. Ferguson. Oh, thank you. What is it, dear? My flight confirmation, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I'll, uh, I'll pack your things, Thank excuse you, me. The O'Malley deal? Yes, we're closing in Liverpool tomorrow. Oh, 15 to 20 percent. You know, with that kind of profit, I could expand this business. Perhaps build a new wing for the guests or even a swimming pool. You really want in badly, don't you, Charles? Very badly, Joe. All right, you're in. Good. But don't Excellent. say I didn't warn you. I'll give you my check for 850 pounds. Charles, the deal is in cash. But well, O'Malley stipulated that. Well, in that case, I'd better get over to the bank right Father, away. can't Mr. Ferguson lay it out for you? But, why, of course no, I could. No, oh, no, I did like no, you, Charles. No, Joe, I want you to have my money. Then I shall know that I'm really in. Excuse me. How are you flying, Mr. Ferguson? Air views from Southampton? No, they were books. I've chartered a private plane. Mm. Rather expensive, isn't it? Sixty pounds. What kind of a plane is it? Skycraft, I think. Why do you ask? Four-seater. Too bad you can't find someone to share the expenses with you. Now, where would I find someone headed for Liverpool on such short notice? I'd... I'd like to go. You? What on earth for? For art, Mr. Ferguson. They say Liverpool has become quite a mecca for painters. To say nothing of those beautiful Lancashire girls, eh, Morgan? I always did want to try some portraits. <laughs> yes, I can see who's been putting ideas in your head. <laughs> your attitude surprises me, Mr. Ferguson. I should think you'd be delighted to have someone share the expenses with you. What? Unless, of course, you had some reason for not wanting someone to accompany you. My dear man, I can assure you I couldn't care less one way or the other. You're acting as if you care, Mr. Ferguson. Acting? What are you talking about? I think you know what I'm talking about. Now, what's got into her? Perhaps the truth, Mr. Ferguson. Perhaps the truth. <laughs> Joe Ferguson, a confidence man, uh, really, Hester. Then how do you explain his asking for all this money in cash? He didn't ask for it, dear. I, I offered it to him. Joe's a very successful businessman. That's what he appears to be. But how can we really be sure? I am sure, dear. Like you were with the antique shop that went bankrupt inside of a month. Like you were with the waterfront lots that turned out to be swamps. Oh, come, come, dear. Anyone can make a mistake. We can't afford to make another mistake. This money is all we have left. That is why it is so important that we invest it profitably. Now, at 15 or 20 percent, I... 15 or 20 percent? One at a hundred percent? One at a thousand percent? All right, dear. 
All right. Don't cry. If it means that much to you, I'll get out of the deal. You don't have to get out of the deal. You could send somebody to Liverpool with him. Somebody to hold your money until we're sure it's legitimate. But who, for instance? Send Harry. What, trust my money to that drifter? Father! You'd better start trusting him. Because he's going to be your son-in-law. Why, oh, Hester, my dear. I didn't know. You fool! Get your hands off me! Found her hair! You teach you what you want! Get your hands off! Ah! That's only a sample, Walters. Try it again, and I'll kill you. What's going on here? Stupid. Private matter. Are you all right? Your friend. Facts quite a punch for a business tycoon. Well, what happened? He said he didn't like my remarks at lunch, and that if I tried to scotch his deal with your father, I'd get worse than this. Joe said that. Only his choice of language wasn't quite so genteel. Harry, Father has a favor to ask of you. Yes, Harry. Uh, I'd like you to go to Liverpool for me tomorrow and sort of keep an eye on my money. If you mind. I'd be honored, Mr. Wade. Thank you, Harry. Good night. Good night, sir. Well. Darling. When you get to Liverpool, I want you to leave all those beautiful Lancashire girls for Morgan. Are you jealous? Madly jealous. Good. I like jealous women. I don't ever want to lose you, darling. Without you, I am the night without stars. Without you, I am a night without stars. An infinite blackness, unwarmed by the fires of your love. Unembraced, I embrace all the world, yet have nothing. For I am the absence of life without you. The next morning, all three went separately to the airport. Joe Ferguson refused to share a car with Harry. And Morgan had to go into town, to the chemist's shop. You know why? What for? To purchase some air sickness pills, I believe. Yeah, Mr. Morgan Price is beginning to interest me. I can assure you, Jack, he's perfectly harmless. But I can't say the same for Joe Ferguson. And on the night before the flight, you actually heard Ferguson threatening Walters? He threatened to kill him, but not for the reason you think. Well, then how do you explain it, Mrs. Ferguson? One week of Harry's taunting was all I could bear. I knew that if I paid what he demanded, I'd never be rid of him. He'd keep coming back for more. That night, I... I told Joe everything. He was kind and forgiving to me. More so than I deserved. Was he? Are you suggesting that he wasn't? I'm suggesting that a man who learns a thing like that might be angry with someone and very possibly with his wife. He might threaten to sue for a divorce. Oh, he made no such threat. He was angry, yes, but only with Harry Walters for exploiting my fears. He said he was going to teach Harry a lesson. Well, then you admit that they fought. Well, of course they fought. You realize that whichever version of this story happens to be correct, your husband had a motive for killing Walters. So did I, Inspector. So did you. Jack. Oh, excuse me, Jack. There's a mm -hmm. constable downstairs who wishes to speak to you. Me? Yes. Thank you. Excuse me. You'll be sorry for all those lies. I'm sorry for you, Hester. Oh, thank you. Uh, wait outside, will you? You can take it back to the property clocks as soon as I've been identified. <clears throat> now, here are some items that have been recovered from the Bristol Channel near the scene of the crash. I'd like you to identify them for me if you can. Why? These beyond belong to Morgan Price. He used to keep them in his room. Poor man. 
He'll never paint those Lancashire portraits now. May he rest in peace. May they both rest in peace. Morgan Price and whoever was with him. We'll be back with the third act of The Man Who Didn't Fly in a moment. This is Ed Hurley, he's speaking, and we'll bring you tonight's play in a moment. But first, here's one of the secrets of wonderful meals. Kraft Deluxe Margarine. Kraft Deluxe brings you that certain unmistakable flavor of the most expensive spread. You can't spread finer flavor at any price. You can prove it to yourself with Deluxe and Hot Biscuits. Spread Deluxe generously on a hot, tender biscuit and take one delectable bite. You know, hot biscuits or rolls are a critical test of the taste of any spread. And Kraft Deluxe scores a flavor triumph. In fact, Kraft guarantees you can't tell Kraft Deluxe margarine from the costly spread. You can't spread finer flavor at any price. Our good Kraft cooks like to serve biscuits and deluxe for breakfast, along with fruit, crisp bacon, and eggs fried in delicate deluxe margarine. Look for Kraft Deluxe in this red and gold package next time you shop. In the western states, you'll find Deluxe in this familiar package. Tea. No, 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 don't bother. I just dropped by for a second. You know, there's a, a police department affair over in Exeter next weekend. I thought maybe you'd like to go with me. Thanks, Jack, but I don't think so. Well, I know that you used to enjoy them. Yes. Do you remember the night that uh, <laughs> Sergeant, Sergeant Kelman lost his wig just before the show went on? <laughs> He was, he was the first bald Lady Macbeth in history, I think. <laughs> oh, Hester. I never knew why you stopped seeing me. It was nothing against you, Jack. You were always good to me. It was just that I needed something else. Something you weren't able to give me. You should have told me what. I would have tried. I would still try. It wouldn't work. Hester, it's nearly a month since the crash. How long are you going to wait? I still can't believe that Harry's dead. As long as there's a chance, one tiny chance that he's alive, I'll wait. Well, if he is alive, why hasn't he been in touch with him? You still think Harry ran off with father's money? No, I didn't say that. I've told you Joe Ferguson is the confidence man. Apparently you don't believe me. Well, don't overlook the fact that... Ferguson and Walters might have been working together. Oh, that's ridiculous, Jack. You have a lot of faith in a man that you knew only a week. I knew him all my life. I had him for a week. Hester. Hester. I think you know how I feel about you. Regardless of how this thing turns out, I wish you every happiness. milk. Might help you to sleep. Thank you. Hester. <clears throat> Darling. I know how much you cared for Harry. But don't you think you might show a little more friendship for Jack? He is very fond of you, dear, and... You can't expect a man to wait forever. I don't care if he does or he doesn't. Darling, you can't go on living in the past. Jack is settled and established. You never approved of Harry, did you? 
darling, what difference can that possibly make now? He wasn't settled or established enough to suit you. He committed the unpardonable crime of being different. Now, darling... Why don't you admit it? You want him to be dead. I'm sorry you feel that way, dear. Good night, darling. So ends our program of music to dream by. Until tomorrow, this is Raymond Campbell wishing you good night with this parting thought. Without you, I am the night without stars, an infinite blackness, unwarmed by the fires of your love. Unembraced, I embrace all the world, yet have none. Help! For I have been Get me BBC in London. Hurry, please, it's urgent. Albert, hurry, please! Hello. I'd, I'd like to someone connected with the music to dream by program. It just fell off the air. Anyone, it doesn't matter. The announcer, if possible. Yes, yes, I'll wait. <laughs> Campbell here. Mr. Campbell, my name is Hester Wade. I'm calling from Furlong Deep. It's in Devon, near Exeter. I'm uh, sorry, I haven't much time to talk now. I've got a new spot please coming. Please don't hang up! You read a poem tonight. I want to know where you got it. I clipped it from the London Times this morning. Did you tell me who wrote it? I really can't remember, Miss. I suggest you pick up the Times. I can't pick up a copy of the Times. We're 150 miles from London. It's delivered here. Then why don't you send them a self-addressed envelope? You don't mind. understand. I must know who wrote it now. Please. It's very important to me. Well, just a moment. I may have it here someplace. No. Oh. Here it is. It was written by uh, Ralph Thorndike. Uh, Thorndike. No, I don't know where you can find it, but I imagine you might look him up in the telephone book. Yes. T H O R N D Y K E. Thorndike. Thorndike. I've come to inquire about a poem that appeared in the London Times. Oh, uh, well, I, I... Well, won't you come in, please? Uh, you must excuse me, but I'm on my way out right now to, to make a deadline. Now then, <clears throat> what about that poem in the Times? You didn't write it, did you? Well, of course not. I keep T.S. Eliot locked in my closet. It's not a joking matter, Mr. Thorndike. I happen to know that poem was written by Harry Walters. Not the Harry Walters. That's what I said. Well, I never heard of him. Now look here, miss. I suggest that you go on back to whomever sent you and tell them that their little practical joke did not work very well at uh, 9.22 in the morning. Where did you get this jacket? It's not mine. Well, Whose is it? It belongs to my roommate. What's his name? Now why on earth should that be of any interest to you? Please tell me his name. His name is Harold Porter. And I rent him a room in the back. I don't know what he does for a living, but he's away most of the time, which is fine with me. Because I like peace and quiet while I'm writing. Now, shall we go? They were all out of hard work. Ah, the illustrious Mr. Porter himself. Hester, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? Oh, Harold, old fellow, if my editor should call, would you tell him that I'm on my way? All right. Darling. Darling, what a happy coincidence. I was just going to call you. Said your name was Harold Porter. Harold Walters Porter, darling. It's my mother's maiden name. I use it quite often. You didn't use it in the poem in the Times. Oh, that. I saw that. I was curious, Adam. It wasn't the first time he stole something from me. You didn't fly to Liverpool, did you, Harry? No, darling. Come and sit down. Those poor chaps. Good thing. I even feel sorry for Ferguson now. Not that I, I had much better luck, but at least the, 
The auto crash was on dry land. Auto crash? Why, why, yes. On the way to the, to the airport. I was just released from the hospital last night. Too late to call you, though. You could have called me while you were in the hospital. If I had known who I was, darling. I had a complete loss of memory. The doctors called it total amnesia induced by shock and emotional trauma. Isn't that a mouthful? What happened to father's money? Oh, that's perfectly safe. The uh, hospital kept it for me, and uh, while I was there, and I put it in the bank this morning. Oh, darling, it's so good to see you. It's a funny thing about amnesia, you know. It settles over you like a fog. Obliterating names and places. But only certain things remain. Familiar scenes that you can't quite place. The faces of those you know and love, and whose names you can't quite remember. Your face was there, darling. Every minute of the day. Liar. 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 The next time you want to steal, Harry, use a gun. Don't make a woman fall in love with you. Do you know how much I loved you? Trusted you. Believed in you. When I thought you might be dead, I almost stopped living myself. Harry Walters, I'm Inspector Lewis of the Exeter Police. Yeah. What, what do you want with me? I haven't done anything. That's not what the warrant says. Fraud, embezzlement, blackmail, suspicion of murder by sabotage. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Inspector, I, I have friends in the city. Influential friends. You're making a very big mistake. It seems funny now. But I was actually afraid of meeting you. Take him away, Constable. <laughs> Most ridiculous. When you told your father this morning that you were going to London, he got worried and called me. I've been tagging along ever since you boarded the train at Exeter. Hester, I can understand why you fell in love with him. Just very handsome, very charming. I'll never be like that. But I want you to know that I care very much for you. I can give you a lift back to Exeter. Well, if you'd rather be alone for a while. Jack, I'll take that lift. Tonight's cast and news about next week's play in a moment. But first, our good craft cooks are fixing a complete one-dish casserole meal that's extra good for the whole family because it's made with Velveeta, Kraft's famous pasteurized processed cheese spread. We've cut half a pound from the big two-pound loaf of Velveeta to melt in a double boiler with a third of a cup of milk. The golden cheese sauce goes over cooked rice and peas seasoned with chopped onion and pimento and mixed with chopped hard-cooked eggs. We'll bake our Velveeta dinner 25 minutes in a slow oven for this quick summertime casserole that's so good for the family. Because today's Velveeta is richer than ever in vital food values from the non-fat part of the milk. Why, just two ounces of Velveeta in a sandwich give your child more high-quality protein, more calcium, more phosphorus, as much riboflavin, and more vitamin A 
than a big eight-ounce glass of fresh whole milk. And Velveeta has plenty for mom and dad, too. Because Velveeta's extra goodness comes from the non-fat part of the milk, it's a wonderful health safeguard for Weight Watchers, especially you young mothers, before and after the baby comes. Have Velveeta with fruit for dessert or a satisfying snack. Remember to get more of milk's vital food values into your family's meals by way of snacks and main dishes, too. Get Velveeta, Kraft's famous pasteurized processed cheese spread that is full of health from milk. Next week, the Kraft Mystery Theater presents Focus on Murder by Mel Goldberg. Based on the novel by George Harmon Cox. <laughs>